me and that will be the um, title of this episode. Because <laughs> I think that's an awesome title right there. That's number one. Thank you, thank you. Number two, you're our new best friend. Yes. Why? Because he has mangoes? <laughs> Mom, I got a new best friend. I'm his friend because he got mangoes. That's What's your reason? <laughs> because I want Seth Godin. Oh, you can't use Don for that. You have to do of like he did. Can. Yes, I can. That's how we got Jeb. Hey, Warners, welcome to another episode of The Women Your Mother Warned You About. The podcast that makes business sexy again. I'm Gina Tremarco, master sales trainer at Sales Gravy, uh, who's also the sponsor of this show. And I'm Rachel Pitts, a creator of Your Ultra Fit Lifestyle and business entrepreneur, small business owner, woo woo, all the things. <laughs> all the things, so, all the things that keep us busy. So excited about today's guest. He's so, he's got, Don Kelly has got such great stories and he's another one of those ones I wish that we had more time with. I know. I want, I want him back for, if you don't know who Donald C. Kelly is, he is the founder and chief sales evangelist at the sales evangelist. We have known him for a few years now. Um, actually we were, I think we were trying to get him on our show or he was trying to get on our show. I can't like when we first started the show three years ago, if you recall. And, um, I talked to him about that at outbound. I was like, I'm so sorry. We didn't get you on sooner. Like, I know he's like, it's cool. And, and, and the, but he, he was on the show, the live stream show at Outbound, and we loved him, and we we got him on today. And I just love this episode with him. I love it. Yeah, what what really struck me about when Don is telling his his stories about how he very, very first started, got started in sales, it very much reminded me of stories that Gina has told about <laughs> selling in the flea market. So it's just really fascinating how those types of scenarios early in life can really affect you throughout life. I mean, Gina, you still reference that toaster story all the time because it's so illustrative of certain parts of the sales process. Yeah. And I loved your face when he revealed the name of his book. And of course she had to go at me again about a book. Um, I don't know the word toaster could show up in the title of a book. But Don's book that is just coming out, I believe, is called Sell It Like a Mango. And in his stories that he tells, he helps to explain why the title, that title is there. It's really fascinating from his um, childhood. And it's just a really great conversation about how to differentiate yourself in the marketplace, which is so essential. As we all know, there's so much noise in social media and email and TV and, you know, all your phone and all the the things that distract us, how to stand out as a salesperson so that you can be more successful among other things that we chat about. I, and I, I love that this entire episode was a conversation as all of our episodes are, and that's on purpose. And I love the fact that he pointed that out because what we want people to walk away from every episode is a couple nuggets of knowledge that they can use in business, in sales, but also in their personal life and to have fun while they're learning from these episodes that we put out, which are sometimes rogue without a single idea and they turn into something or very intentional with amazing sales experts or business experts. So Warner, sit back and enjoy this really great episode. Maybe, maybe eat some mangoes while you're listening. Enjoy. Welcome to the Women Your Mother Warned You About, Donald Kelly. Hey, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. I don't even know where I want to dive in with you personally, but, um, Oh, no, I do. I want to I want to jump into this. Your early sales pedigree traces to a roadside stand in Jamaica mm. because I we love story, right? Everybody wants to know story and where people come from. And I want to hear this Jamaican story. Yeah, man. So you want to know a Jamaican accent? I want to chat like a yes. Yankee American. Yes. You can go back and forth, whatever you want. <laughs> so my family, we, uh, Jamaica, just to kind of set the, the, everyone to set the stage for this, you know, Jamaica is not like, everyone doesn't live in like shanties and things like that. But Jamaica is a third world country classification 
wise, I mean, the one of the biggest export out of Jamaica is its people. It has a fantastic education system, and most people will get you know degrees and go off to like you know to Europe or to uh, North America, your United States or to Canada, take advantage of opportunities. So, but it's, it's just not there are not tons of different jobs that you can take advantage of. So people who are there. In Jamaica, you know, the, the jobs that are there to take those, but then also figure out a way to make money. Mm. So families and individuals will create opportunities. I didn't see it as sales. It's just like a business month. So when my aunt, she came to the United States and she would buy uh, clothing and things here and take it back to Jamaica and sell it. And um, she also sold oil and some some of these other things as well. Um, and it was really, really neat. It was just it was just what our family did. And they had this on uh, in the market so to speak, at a, you know, a, a stand. Um, and it, she just did that for a very long time. And um, it was really cool to, to see it. So one time I wanted to make money. And I was like, how can I make money? The natural thing I would think about would do something like that. My dad was also an entrepreneur in Jamaica. And he had several things. He had a cesspool company and a blueprinting company. And uh, there's still a, the blueprinting company is still around. My half sister runs it in Jamaica. And um, he, so they, they still doing all this, still doing all these, some of these things there, but it was just, that's the type of the thing that I saw. That's the type of career. That's the type of the, the lifestyle that I was around. If you want to earn money, you go out and do something. So I wanted to make some money. I wanted to go buy these like Ninja. It was on a bike. Um, and it was like one of those little remote control thingies, but it was like tied to it or, or whatnot. And I was like, that would be super cool actually it wasn't remote on, on that one but it was just really really neat this guy on the bike you pull it and he goes off and i was like i want it so i created a little roadside stand um so to speak in our yard and i got some mangoes and i put them on our little um this like it was a plant um display that my aunt had and i took it and bring it out and and i put the little mangoes on there and i try to sell because that's what i saw if you want to make money become a business month and um it was just in my livelihood and so from my aunt with her business from my dad with his business from my family friends if in, you know the business that they had that's how you would do things and that roadside stand kind of um, that my family had kind of helped to uh, facilitate and, and inspire me to keep going to what I'm doing right now in sales. What was the running rate for mangoes at that time? <laughs> you know, I mean, I know I'm on a mango. I mean, I don't know if I chop for the mango. I mean, just I try to make some money. So we probably sell it for like what you got in Jamaican money, probably like. <laughs> Probably ten dollars or something like $10 that. Ten dollars a mango. <laughs> Jamaican dollars a little different uh, than gotcha, US dollars. Gotcha. <laughs> Man, I love mangoes. I love mangoes. You know, I'm, I'm curious. I, what I love about this story is, um, and Rachel knows this. Um, I grew up as a kid. My dad made us work in a flea market, and yeah. you know, it's, it's kind of similar to what you're talking about, like. And and I was listening to um, I was listening to another podcast where we talk about the cultural differences and you know how different countries actually are insulted if you don't negotiate because that's yes. you know that's that just you negotiate that's part of it so if you're not going to negotiate right it's an an insult and having grown up working in a flea market right like negotiation is, is like second nature to me like I don't even. It doesn't make me uncomfortable. It's just like you you go back and forth and it's supply and demand. And I tell a story about my dad selling a toaster and a $5 toaster. And, you know, then he changed the price to $10 because this guy kept coming back wanting to haggle. And every time he came back, the toaster got more expensive because the demand for it went up. It was the only toaster available apparently in the flea market. So I'm curious what are, and it took me a long time as an adult to, to what, what did I learn from that? What did you learn? What are some of the things that you saw that you see that you can now apply as a salesperson? What did you learn from that? Like what were the common denominators? There, there's so many. Um, I just finished up my book, um, and uh, it's called "Sell It Like a Mango: um, A New Seller's Guide to Closing More Deal." Yeah, sell it like a mango. Um, Stop it, Rachel. Gina, Gina has she has sell a really like great a toaster. Book. Yeah, the, the toaster, the toaster story is going to be in Gina's book that she's going to finish soon, right? <laughs> but anyway, sell it like a mango. Go on. Yeah, a new seller's guide to closing more deals. And here's the thing with it, um, you know, the Lee just was it Lee uh, Les who just finished his book. Um, Lee Sauls. Lee Sauls. Yeah, there you go. I'm putting all these different names together. Lee just finished his books. Um, sell differently. 
when we were at Outbound, we were talking about it because somebody was like, hey, Jeff, I think was like, Donald, this, you know, you guys are kind of like on a similar area. But think about this, the, the, the mangoes that you have in Jamaica, it's not like you have Dominican mango or you have like, you know, Chilean mango or United States mango. You get the same mango from the same region and these same people are selling the mangoes. What makes one mango seller or one individual selling fruit different than the other when everything is equal, mm-hmm. right? What can you make that's going to be different? You have different species of the mango. Yeah. But what, what can you do? And the concept in the book is that's kind of like what we, we did as I was um, doing it, working with my coach on writing his book is like, how can we take that knowledge, that idea and, and make it um, into, you know, B2B selling? So one of the principles going back to your question here ties very closely with that. When I did my fruits, on that, that stand, that mango stand on the side of the road, guess how much money I made that day? How much? Zip. Oh, no. The first day I made zip. And here's why. Because people were walking past, but I never went out and said uh, anything to them. Yeah. Because I was afraid that they might reject it. I didn't bring the mango. Imagine a cute little Jimmy. I got a runner on it. Imagine what, what could, I probably could have made some more, some money from it. But I wanted people to come to me because I figured that's how they're going to have the interest. I So several things there. One, I assumed. Number two, and you never assume in sales. Number two, you, I also, I didn't take action. I was waiting for things to come. And you find that with a lot of the sellers today, they're just so afraid. They want to do the inbound only. I'm not a big fan. I, I don't have nothing against inbound. I, I take my inbound leads. Last week was a great week um, with some inbounds, but it's not the only thing. You got to do a multi, you multi uh, uh, omni-channel approach, right? But you, you, I had to go out there in order to get something to happen. And then the third part to that too, is not only having a, a good message, not only going out and not only um, making sure that I actually, uh, you know, overcome my fear and not assume I needed to make sure that I was the loudest, so to speak. And I'm not saying loud and, and like being obnoxious, but being there are other people selling mangoes as well. What can I do to make sure I stand out? There are other store, a store across the street, a, a, t- a little shop, and then there's another shop down the street. What am I going to do to stand out to make sure the things that I'm selling? And when it comes towards a seller, the similar thing, you may not be running around in the shorts in a bright color shirt in the streets of Jamaica in your neighborhood, but you're probably going on LinkedIn and you're making the phone calls and you look just like all the other BDRs, so yeah. to speak. How can I make sure that I'm going to stand out? And those are some of the top things that I would say I took away from that experience that translated directly into the way that I operate and sell now as a, as a, um, in, in my B2B efforts. And, and you, you see some of those folks sometimes, you, you remember the movie... Um, the uh, Jamaican bobsled, mm-hmm. you know, the, the guy singing out there. I mean, stuff like that is not that far fetched to see people do it. He's like, no, people say they know they can't believe we have Jamaica, we have a bobsled team. And he's handing out these flyers because what am I, if I can just stand out there, hey, check out our bobsled program. It's going to be fantastic. It's a bunch of Jamaican guys trying to go freeze their tail off. But it, it, he sung a song. He made a reggae song and he was enjoying that moment. Similar concept when it comes towards this B2B selling idea. I can send the same email that you're going to send and to the prospect, but how can I make sure that stand out? That requires me, it'll be a little different. Um, I'll give you one real quick, how I translated that to uh, example. Yes, I've been trying to get Seth Godin on our podcast for a while. Um, and I can show you the emails. And he said, no, not interested. I love Seth Godin, Seth Godin because he responds quickly. Um, and he'll tell you. He'll tell you so no So he did turn me down. No, no, three no's um, so far over several years. And he was the first podcast ever that I listened to. Um, and I was like, man, I listened to and I, um, the book Purple Cow. And I was like, yeah. I started taking that concept yeah. and infusing it into TSC when we launched it. So in long story short, how I was going to stand out, I was like, he gets a lot of these requests. So I was like, you know what, dude, he must have a quote on being a uh, personal and um, persistent. So I found one of his quotes and I used it in that uh, conversation with him yesterday. I said, screw it. I sent him the quote and I, um, and I said, Hey, Seth, it's Donald again. You, I love the quote that you have about perseverance and I'm going to continue to persevere. I would love to have you on the show. Purple Cow made sure it helped us to build our brand to where we are today. I followed those same principles and I love you. I'm listening to your latest book right now, the practice. And I think the principles there can help our community of sales professionals. Long story short, five minutes later, he responded respond back. I'm glad. I'd love to be able to contribute. Let's go ahead and schedule it. The point was, if I send a regular email, hi, Seth, we have X amount and I would love to, we've been around for this long and we have this much and blah, blah, blah. 
I to- tied to something that he cares about. One, it was the fact that it was Purple Cow. Two, it, I did a video when I did that. Three, I used his own quote and his own material. And then also for his latest book, he's going to be doing a book tour eventually. So I used all of those things to be able to make sure I'm singing in the streets with my mango to grab his attention. Okay. So, so many things I want to say. First of all, <laughs> what's the name of the book? Again, his latest one? You no, know, yours. Sell it like a mango. Sell it like a and mango, because that, that is going to be, Nian, I know you're listening, Nian, that will be the um, title of this episode, because <laughs> I think that's an awesome title right there. That's number one. Thank you, thank you. Number two, you're our new best friend. Yes. Why, because he has mangoes? <laughs> Mom, I got a new best friend. I'm his friend because he got mangoes. That's what's your reason? Because I want Seth Godin. Oh, you can't use Don for that. You have to do of like he did. Can. Yes, I can. That's how we got Jeb. Yes, Gina, I... Gina went after Jeb. That's and... the story I want well, to. Okay, tell. I'll let you tell it because it's yeah. Your story. So, so I'm basically asking for a referral. That's what I'm doing. The worst Donald can say is no. So, okay, so there's a sales lesson right there, and. Yeah. Never assume. And, and 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 the reason why we're all here at this very moment, Jeb Blunt, is because of Jeb Blunt in some ways, because yeah. I went after him the same thing. Like wanted to get him on the show, wanted to get him on the show. Wanted, I went different routes. Like we started this podcast started um under uh Jeffrey Gittimer and, and his seller die network. That's how the show started. And um you know, I tried to get to Jeb that way. And then we got Anthony and Arena on the show and I tried to get to Jeb that way. And Anthony's like, he's a busy guy. I'm like, could you just make an introduction? And he didn't. And um <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Anthony. Thanks for Thanks, that. Thanks, Anthony. Thank we you. love you. Anthony Bus. Yeah. And, and Anthony, um, but but we at the second <laughs> the second time we had Anthony on the show, um, we talked about this. And Jeb laughs about it now that that um Anthony, I think he was we called Anthony the gateway drug. He, Anthony was the gateway <laughs> drug to Jeb. So um, I finally, same thing, sent emails, you know, kept asking, kept, finally, I found his Achilles heel. So one of his book launches was happening and I got an email about one of them. I think it was objections. And I said, I was like, I tried again. I'm like, hey, would love to promote your book on our show. Come on. That's all Come you got to do with Jeb. And, and he's like, okay. I'm like, oh my God, he finally <laughs> responded. <laughs> that was the secret sauce. And so that's how we got him on the show. And um, I got a micro commitment out of him uh, on that show. I'm like, well, then, you know, next time you have a book, I, he's like, I do. It's coming out in January. I'm like, all right, let's schedule you now. So we got him scheduled right away for like five months later to talk about the next book. And then that became the running joke. I'm like, well, next time you have a, he's like, I don't have to come back just because of a book. <laughs> We're like, all right. So that's how the relationship started. Um, that snowballed into where we are now. Um, I joined the company full time, left my business to join sales gravy. He said, you need to bring the podcast with you. I'm like, well, let me see what Rachel says. And <laughs> no telling there. <laughs> and, um, but that, that's a great example of perseverance, right? Like what you're talking yeah. about of you just, the worst thing someone can say to you is no, but how many times do salespeople like give up after the second or third try? So the other thing is that I, I take away from both of those approaches is that you both made Seth and Jeb the important person. It was, it was no longer, Hey, I'd like to have you on my yeah. show. It yeah. was, Hey, I'd like to help you promote what you got going on. And yeah. and like you said, Don, um, utilizing a quote from somebody, it's an honor to them. And people like to be made, made to feel important. They don't like to be sold yeah. to. We all know that. But they do. Everyone loves to be complimented on something witty or something you know, intelligent that they've said a quote. And of course, everybody who has a book likes to promote it. You'll be like that too, Gina, when yours is done. Yeah. When it's, <laughs> I mean, I did make a commitment. I'm actually in the process of talking to a ghostwriter. Finally. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, uh, something's got to give. So, so something's that's, gotta give. that's in process. Um, 
again, interesting, you know, how these different things happen. And, um, when you make it about other people, I had someone yeah. in one of my courses this week at sales gravy. Um, this woman had, she had reached out to me before the course started because she didn't get the information for the course. And we had some emails and she kept apologizing. So I'm like, it's no big deal. Like sometimes the emails don't come through. And she sent me a follow-up email after the course. And, um, it was on, it was email prospecting was the workshop. And, um, she, you know, I taught them uh, the framework and how to have good, um, subject lines. And her subject line to me was amazing. She sent the subject line about improv. I can't remember it exactly, but the word improv was in there. And, and of course, I like opened it right away. She's like, I hope the subject line got you to open my email because <laughs> I gave, you know, I gave them homework. I'm like, email me your emails and your subject lines. Sure enough, I got it open. I opened it. She's like, I, so she's been come, she became like a fan girl a little bit, right? Cause she's like, um, I'm listening to an episode, a podcast with you and Jeb right now. And I just think you're so great. And thank you for the workshop. And it was so awesome. And I learned so much and I can't wait to learn more with you. And I've signed up for fanatical prospecting with you. And did you say that you're in Myrtle beach? I thought you said that I'm listening to Jeb and something about Myrtle beach. And she's like, I'm going to be on vacation there next week with, um, with my family. And I know, please don't think I'm weird. I mean, I'm not, I mean, I don't really expect you to meet with me, but I'd love to have coffee with you. Cause I just want to like, you just seem like you'd be fun. Mm. And I'm like, that is awesome. I'm like, I will find a way to have coffee with her. Gina's pretty fun. <laughs> I mean, I will find a way to, because it's like, that is like, that's flattering for one. Yeah. But anytime someone resonates with you and you can, I think any of us doing what we do, like we really want to help people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think there's it's it's really neat in the in that sense, right? Like it's the the human nature. I, I've I talk to students sometimes, and I I have the privilege of um, doing a, an adjunct for my alma mater um, with their sales program. And one of the things that I tell the students is like, if I could go back to college, one class that I would take, just like whatever credit, I don't care if it's I get credit for it or whatever, it would be under, one of the human psychology class, like understand human nature, yes. really understand. I may have mentioned this already before when we were on stage, but the, the, the crazy part about that, go back to this conversation with Jeb or to Seth or, or whatnot. It's like, and I think it's Zig who said it back in the days, like, you know, you can give, you can get anything you want in life. If you help people accomplish, you get what they want in life and just understanding what people want yeah. and speaking to that, that helps you to become a better help you to help them persuade themselves um, in sales. And it's, it doesn't matter if you're selling software or um, to a ship or a car or a TV or whatever. It's not about the product. It's not even uh, half the time it's about the problem that you can solve. It's how that problem can help. How can you help me yeah. as an individual? And now a word from our fabulous sponsor, Jeb Blunt at Sales Gravy. Hi, this is Jeb Blunt. There's a reason why thousands of sales professionals and top companies across the globe hone their sales skills at SalesGrave University. You see, SalesGrave University is different than most learning platforms. First, we have live courses taught in a virtual classroom by our master trainers that start almost every single day. And our e-learning platform is populated with hundreds of hours of sales training content produced by some of the top sales trainers in the world, including Gina's spontaneous selling course, which is worth checking out. Now I've got some good news. If you've never taken a course on Sales Gravy University, if you're a new user, you can take your very first course for free. That's any course on the platform, absolutely free. Just go to learn.salesgravy.com. That's learn.salesgravy.com or click the e-learning tab in the top menu at salesgravy.com. Pick out your course. And when you check out, use coupon code free course to get that course for free. That is free course to get your very first course for free. Speaking of Sales Gravy University, go check out salesgravy.university and see some of the courses that I'm teaching. Just scroll through the university and click on them and you will find me and sign up. I'd love to have you there. That's so big. I see this. I don't know if you see this. I see this a lot when I'm when I'm teaching any kind of framework around you know, messaging or emails or telephone, um, making calls. I see salespeople struggle over and over again with something as simple as how they can solve someone's problem yeah. because they don't take the time to understand the problem 
at a granular level, right? We, mm. we all have time objections and money objections. Um, everybody wants to make more money and be more efficient, but dig deeper and get more granular and find out what makes them tick and what moves them and get a little bit deeper so that you have a compelling message. And I see people struggle with it over and over again, that they just can't seem to wrap their heads around getting deeper with it. What do you think of that? Oh, it is so true um, because I've been there. I, I was that person. And the, I'll give us, can I give a secret? Yeah. It's, it's a secret. We like lots of secrets. I'm alone. Okay. No it's one's, cold. no one's listening. So <laughs> <laughs> the secret that I found out is that the answer to become, to sell into an organization and get the details that you need is to call into the salespeople. Yes call into the sales or call into the end users. Here's the reason, like when I, I made this mistake, when I sold software, there's a huge difference here. Some people would say, well, you're not supposed to be messing with the end user. Yet you're not selling to the end user. That's, they're not going to be your champion. The end user gives me the details that I need so I can go to the champion or yeah. go to the person that's going to help to the decision. So if I, let's say I'm calling into an industry I know nothing about. If you give me that, I'd come join your company, whatever company you guys have. And it's in the oil refinery industry or whatever. I know nothing about oil that it goes in car, makes it goes vroom, vroom or, or whatnot. And, uh, <laughs> um, but maybe it doesn't make it go vroom, vroom, but it, it helps it to move somehow. Uh, <laughs> beep, beep. Beep, beep. That's what it does. It, oil makes it go beep, beep. So the, you know, but the point is there, I could, there's pro, there's a lot of problems that people have. And they, if you came to, if I'm sure if I went to one of those individuals and say, Hey, we can help you save time and, or make more money. Like, yeah, yeah. Get in line. Everybody else can say that. But what if I was to go in to the organization and I call in and found out, Hey, one of the big things in our company right now, our initiatives that our, our team's leading on is trying to figure out how we can go green and how we can catch up because, you know, X, X percent of our market share is dwindling. And over the next five years, it's going to decrease by X amount. Um, you can check out one of his articles. Cool. Cool, man. Thanks. I appreciate that. I'm going to send you a gift card. Cool. Now I can reach out. Hey, um, Ken, I know that one of the big issues on the plate right now is how can you guys get more market share, especially with the rise of electronic vehicles and the decrease in the in, in so forth. Market share is going to be dwindling by X amount of percentage over the next several years. I would love to share with you how we've helped Exxon with this. Would you be at least open to a five to seven minute conversation? Boom. Boom. I take, took the information from internal and then I was able to use that in a specific issue. Now that person is not that, that yeah, it can definitely help them make more money, but it's more granular specifically around electronic vehicle and the market share yeah. is dwindling when it comes towards that. But you just get your intel and people are not, that's the part people are not willing to do. They're not willing to, to, to take, a, and it's not like I, that would take forever, you know, make a phone call, take it, the time you're taking to go and do your own self research and dig around, just call into the organization, talk to uh, uh, someone and uh, as an end user and get from them mm -hmm. Intel that can help you in your, in your efforts. Um, and that's what separates the, the, the big kids from the folks who are begging. What did Jeb call them? The, the, the skinny kids? Sales people with skinny the, kids. He called it, he called it, um, <laughs> There's no, there's another uh, at, at, um, at outbound. He kept using this term to differentiate different types of salespeople. Oh, like basically, I can't remember, and I should. It'll come. No, man. It'll so, come back anyways, to us. One of Jeb's uh, Jebism. apologies. Jebism. But you get the point, though, with it, with it. So I'm a believer in that. That you speak to speak to specific things. And another secret. I mean, I'm giving you all all of this stuff today. But the other secret that I thank I've you learned, for all this free stuff. You know, like, <laughs> um, was I worked at a, in a software world and I was selling to city county governments in K-12 and one of our top competitors, I was like, man, what are these guys, how are these guys doing it? And I stumbled on this by accident, you know, I went to their website and they had all these wonderful case studies and I'm like, wait, hold up, wait a freaking minute. These guys are selling to the same exact clients we are, the same exact type of people. They're solving the same products, they have the same product that we have. Can I take the points or the pain from their case studies and use it in my verbiage? Absolutely, because they've discovered granularly why they their solution was so effective. So I was able to use that same type of messaging. I didn't say, hey, we have a client that we did this for, but we use the same type of messaging. I was able to, it's basically an end user telling me the pain and I was able to use that because our company did not have those detailed case studies. 
But that detailed case study that they provided was able to help me to be able to start a conversation. Hey, I'm sure your situation probably like this, where you're trying to get your staff to perform better, you know, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Just repeat everything from that case study. And they're like, dang, this person understands our problem real deep. Yes. If I could share with you how we can do this, would you be open to that? Yeah, be open to that. Isn't that a myth? And that's like, it's so easy peasy. I don't get why, like, why do you think people don't go and do that homework? It's because I think there's a couple things here. One, we have, I'm going to blame leadership and I'm going to blame the individuals as well. And, but the other part to that too, is the, we have this, uh, this in our, in our industry, in the sales world, this, this view of what the iconic seller is. And that comes from the gift of gab Mm -hmm. or this idea of just being able to call in and just to make things happen Mm -hmm. and just speak off the cuff. And I think that's one of the issues Mm -hmm. there. And also it's just the, the blueprint that's been uh, perpetuated salespeople make phone calls. They go into CRM, they update, they use these templates. However, in the leadership sense, it's the other problem. Leaders tell you, and I get it from their standpoint. They're like, listen, we need to get the yeah. deals closed. We need to get appointments for AEs. If you're an account executive, you guys just need, I mean, a BDR, you just, just pump it out. Just make the phone calls, make the phone calls. We all say we want them to personalize, but then the numbers make it challenging for us to, <laughs> to give that to them. So you want to empower your individuals or your team on doing that. And something like that doesn't take too, too long to do. I like to tell my team is like, listen, this is your, this is your business. And when I made the switch in my head, when I looked at my territory and I saw that my territory was like a franchise and this is my freaking business. Mm -hmm. So I want to make the money that I need to. And if I need to do that, that means I need to get up early and look at some of these things for the prospect. I need to spend the last 20 minutes of the day and prep for tomorrow. I need to make sure I have the things in place that are going to help me to make those outreaches. Um, Who are the top clients that I want to get into these top prospect? What can I do to make that happen. Just like I'm going to do prospecting, schedule that 15, 20 minutes to call into these companies to get the intel that I need so I can make a better impact. Now, everyone, not all the size companies that uh, we went after organizations, you know, requisite that to happen. Some of them, I didn't need to do that much detail in, but I came with a little bit more intel, at least um, doing what, uh, you know, uh, what's the name? Uh, Gabe Giamong, Jay Gabe forgot you gave me last time I'm going to butcher it, but Gabe always talks about the idea of a three by three, mm-hmm. find three things about their company in three minutes and you can be, have more effect, yeah. effective call rather than just doing a one call, um, trying to blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I, I've had, I've had a lot of salespeople say to me that oh, there's like so much research I got to do with that. I'm like, not really just, no. and this is something we would teach our improv performers as improv performers. When you're on stage without a script and you're trying to engage the audience, um, and get them to be like, wow. What I would say is know a lot, know a little about a lot. Know a little about a lot. I'd say do things like watch TMZ, like get up, get up on current events. What's going on in Hollywood? Like know a little about everything out there so that you have some level of relatability and the audience is like, oh, she, they get me. They understand me. Yes. You don't have to spend a ton of time doing it. I worked with a client recently that I was coaching and he would go and read company quarterly reports. And that's mm. where he would pull out the data of what was going mm. on and what the pain points were and what they were struggling with so he could talk in their language, kind of like what you're saying. Or yeah. I look at um, having really good discovery calls where I literally write every single thing down that they said. And then when I go back to propose, they always say, this always happens. The landline telephone. That's money. That, That's money right I mean, there. I don't you guys that hear that? Or it's money spam. is coming in. On the landline. <laughs> so, um, you She'd know, probably they, get invited they, they, to They give you a free her. phone line with the internet. And I'm like, no, who uses the phone? Um, <laughs> it's an extended warranty. Exactly. It's an extended warranty. <laughs> so um, I always hear this every time I do the proposal process where they're like, oh, you hit it on the head. You hit everything. Yes. Yeah. I'm like, did I miss yeah. anything? Yeah. No. But you understand us. Yeah. And sometimes, depending on the relationship at that point, I go, I'm just repeating back everything you said to me. I was listening. <laughs> Novel idea. <laughs> I was listening. <laughs> but, I, but I wrote everything down in their words. Yeah. And I think that's, that's the, that's an important idea. Like if, if it's, 
it, it's more about you. And I, I probably forget about half the things that I say, right? If it's been like, you know, about a week since we had the first discovery call to now. So I'm not going to remember all the detail, but if you do come with that, it's going to refresh my memory. And also it's going to be like, crap, you know, I mean, it, it's just going to show that you, even if I don't remember it, I'm going to assume that you, you just know it so well. And anyways, it just puts you in a different light than the, the, the sales rep that's just there to exactly. make a sale. Yeah. Well, and the thing about um, really, really, truly listening, like I love what Gina said about writing down everything that. What was that? <laughs> I love what Gina said about writing down everything because you know when you're in the middle of a sales conversation you're gonna forget what they say and it it for me when I'm writing down everything that they say and taking notes I'm more apt to be really focused on them rather than kind of distracted my phone is going all you know this and that and thinking about other things it's really easy mm -hmm. to fall into that but if you're you can only really think about one thing at a time so if you're just thinking about writing down what they say then you've got you're engaged in the conversation you're truly listening you can repeat back and ask questions of them and find out like do you have the solution that they need maybe you don't but you know someone who does and you can refer them and then you're moving moving them yeah. you're helping mm -hmm. them but not wasting time when you don't necessarily always have the solution i really like that idea there richard like if you're if even if you can't like uh, some people might say, well, if, you know, I can't help them with this, let's, let's just finish this call. But it's like, you know what, I have a friend that potentially could help you out with that. Or, you know, let me think about that and see who I can really help you out, connect you with. And you do some work towards it. That person's That's not right. going to forget that. And you They're never, you, you never know when um, it'll come back. They'll refer you. You just or... never, never know. And I, when mm -hmm. I try, yeah. Gina and I are both very much connectors. And I think a lot of effective salespeople are because we're thinking of like, how can I really help you? And like, I don't have a solution solution, but this guy does. And then it it's, it, I don't do it because I want something back. I do it because I really want to be able to help them. And this guy has the solution. Yeah. Because you care. And then it's like, you yeah. just, it's amazing how that stuff can circle back in good karma kind of ways, you know? Yes. Yes. Oh, so, 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 so true. Um, you never burn a bridge. Um, and uh, you, sometimes you you do it not with the strings attached, but you just do it to help people. And it's just amazing, like how often, like more doors will open. And I have one of those friends, I just, I hate it sometimes, because he's always that individual that just, he makes it that, and he doesn't do it purposely, but you you give value to him. And he's always like one one ups you not purposely, but he's like, just always giving. So I was like, yes, I just helped them out. It's like, it's like me, Rachel helping me out with something and like, sweet, I'm going to do this to give something back to her. I want to help her out. And then out of good faith, all of a sudden he's like, Hey man, I got these tickets to this thing, man. You want to get one? It's like, crap. I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> I can never owe you. Uh, you, can, you know, It's always, I feel like I'm indebted to you because you're always giving so much. And it's the value that they love. And I was talking to this guy and he mentioned what he said, the reason why it is, he's like some people, I do that with people because those people are ones that always seem to give back to me. So I always want to give back to them. You know, I have, I, I will bring this part up of sometimes there's those people that I've got a couple of these in my life where I give and give and give to them. And then I'm like, ah, this person is actually not really, maybe they're grateful, but then they turn around and something happens. I'm like, ah. I helped you out so much, but then I have to remember like helping people. The end reward is that you help someone. It's not that, that I really need something mm -hmm. in return. It's just, it's a, that outpouring of energy that, that creates positive energy coming back. And like, everybody's in a different place in life. And I remember being, when I was younger, I wasn't yeah. able to even think about how I could help people because I was so self-absorbed. And sometimes people that, that we help that, <laughs> don't reciprocate or don't seem to really feel seem grateful or what have you. They're just not mm -hmm. in that place. But the, the giving, it, the giving is kind of like forgiveness too. It's really for our own freedom and, yeah. and that, that positive benefit of just helping people and genuinely wanting to serve rather than genuinely just wanting to take money out of someone's pocket. <laughs> Couldn't agree with you more on that. <laughs> so I want to I want to switch sure. over to then what brought you to America, Mon? Yeah, Mon. You know, America is the land of opportunities. Um, I don't care what people say. Like you know, we have our struggles and our challenges here in the states, and um, but I I know being in Jamaica, like. 
the poorest person in America is probably one of the more wealthier people wow. in uh, Jamaica. And you can think about it in that in that sense because, and I'll give you the, the straight one, the simple, like just being able to have a social security. I don't think people really understand what that is. Growing up in like South Florida, where we have a lot of folks from the Caribbean and um, immigrants, and they're trying to you know become citizens or become like a permanent resident, trying to get a, a green card or like a social security number. I mean, just so much that you can get with that, like you can do um, and opportunities, the doors that open. So anyways, my mom recognized that we, in order for her to get us to the next level in our, for what she, what she can do, she had to sacrifice. And that was a, that was a hard part for us because she came here and in this to the States, <clears throat> my brother and I were in Jamaica and she's came for three years before we came over mm-hmm. And I lived with my aunt um, during that time period, and uh, she hustled and did her thing, and you know got got to the point where she could then uh, you know file for us, and then we came over to the state, and it was for her it was like a better way of life, better opportunities, and education, access to opportunities. I mean, and, and it's not it's not like that's just like it is like this, but everybody when they everyone outside of the U S especially in like um, third world countries, they think it's the streets are paved with gold yeah. and that money just falls from the sky. And they don't realize that there's, you have a lot that you have to do here. You have bills and, you know, things that you need to take care of. However, the opportunities to earn that is a lot easier than it is mm-hmm. in Jamaica or to get access to, you know, the, you know, the schooling and, and capabilities here. So those things that she, she wanted us to put us on a, put us on a path, which could lead us to greater opportunities and i'm grateful for that um for her sacrifice because it wasn't easy i mean we have a yeah. one-year a two-year-old now and i just can't imagine like the idea of leaving him for yeah. an extended period of time oh my like, god that and long. he oh. is <laughs> Thank adorable you. <laughs> every time you post okay, pictures well. i'm like that is the prettiest baby in the world <laughs> Oh, thank you. Thank you. He's so cute. He's, I mean, uh, your wife's beautiful. I mean, you're okay, but you know what? Yeah, I, I just came along. I just throw some chromosome in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then, well, then, so you, you came over here. How did you, and, and thank you for that story, because I think, sure. you know, those of us born and raised here, sometimes we can take it for granted or forget it. Um, you know, I am first generation German, second generation Italian. I know when my mother's family came over here, um, everything that they had to go through and the challenges of becoming a citizen. And it's not easy, but it, yeah. it was it was a better life. And yeah. um, I think sometimes we can be spoiled, entitled Americans and not realize how good we have it. So thanks yeah. for sharing. I'm about a 10th generation of redneck. Course. So... I don't know you guys' <laughs> struggles, but America, I love America. And, and I've lived, I've actually just, I, lived, I even lived in Canada America. for a while, which is about as close to America as you can get. And even there, like, I think the thing I noticed the yeah. most when I went from Canada back to the States is I forgot how many darn cereals there are in the cereal aisle. Like, we take that for granted. <laughs> right. I got back here, I was like, holy moly, yeah. look at this plethora of cereal options. Like, it's <laughs> such a small thing, but like, you know, when you're like at the grocery store, you're like, damn it, oh they God. don't have my strawberry, f- f- you know, whatever flavored <laughs> special K. Like, Frost we're so, plate. you know, <laughs> so spoiled with what we have. Oh, first world problems, first, man. First world first problems. First world problems. And then, um, I, I, I want to talk about you moving into sales before we wrap sure. up, but I, I will say that I worked in the hotel industry for a long time and I was a trainer um, in the hotel industry and especially in Myrtle Beach, we're very transient and we don't have enough labor pool, but we always have, we always have Jamaicans that come over for the summer and yeah. I got to say hardest working people hardest working. And I think, you know, you, you touched on something talking about education. I didn't realize again, like how educated they were. I mean, mm-hmm. these were highly educated. These are like school teachers coming over from Jamaica. One guy was an architect. Like they come over for the summer to bank. Like they want to make yeah. as much money as they can, especially those that were school teachers. And they come over and be housekeepers in the hotel, which is really hard work for really yeah. bad pay. And they come and they do it so that they can make a ton of money to bring back home to their families. And it was, um, 
it was just kind of incredible to work with them. And I, I would have them teach me different lingo uh, I could tell use. Tell us some lingo. You got to test some lingo on Uh-oh. John. Gina got I got to hear it. <laughs> I can't. I can't. Right, no, they didn't teach me anything bad. Oh, I can't God, remember. Um, and this is just, um, it's just a phrase that they use of um, the, the phrase was, you good? You good? You good? You good? Yeah. Rednecks so, use that too, though. Rednecks Wagwan, use Wagwan, like, What's going on? Oh, what was the other one, Donald? Wagwan. Wagwan. That's it. Wagwan. Wagwan. Like, what's going on? Wagwan. What's, how's it going? Wagwan. And then they probably use the one where they call kids uh, picnic. Picnic. Oh no, they didn't teach me that. Picnic. Like, so you, you know, referring to you know, we call them kids here in, in Jamaica. When I heard the term "kid," I was like, "What? You're talking about a goat?" <laughs> um, because it's like you know, goat, and it's like, no, no, no. That's what they call yeah children. Kids. Wag- yeah, wagwan. <laughs> I couldn't remember Noted. wagwan. wagwan. Um, and they loved to cook. <laughs> they would like they yeah. would all share an apartment, like f- four or five of them, while they were here, and then they would like cook these Jamaican meals and bring them to work. It was just. Mm-hmm. It was so cool. So anyway, I digress. But what got awesome. you? So you you had this natural kind of upbringing in sales. I want to call it natural because mm-hmm. it was kind of organic, like I did with the flea market. How did sure. you then? Did you like get into sales right away in your career? It went to um, I went to school and I uh, so you you I'm a um, Latter Day Saint um, mm-hmm. um, LDS Mormon missionaries. Everyone has seen those on the bicycle mm-hmm. before you go out for two years, and it's one of those things. Is really it's like a it's it was really interesting time period. I went to Detroit for a couple of years, and uh, if you can go and talk to about Jesus on a doorstep for a couple of years, I you know. can sell anything. <laughs> so, um, but <laughs> it was uh, it when I did that when I got done with it because I in high school I thought about law or to because i did speech and debate it was law or business and law was definitely winning and i went and i did this and i was like i think i like business and it wasn't because it's a you know you're doing business when you're doing this but it was just like this idea of how um your this this concept of just it just kind of led me towards that business area and i said i'm going to focus on business so i focus on business marketing that's a no university really had any business sales program and um, so I focused on business marketing and I was doing stuff and I was like, yeah, I'm trying to find jobs. And my roommate was like, you should consider sales. You're like, a, and I was like, well, we kind of did do stuff as a kid and, you know, growing up and or whatnot. And he was like, yeah, you should try check it out. So I went and applied for this job and I did, um, I think oh. the first one was timeshare presentations yes. in college, like getting people to go to timeshares. Yes. So I was the call column setting up those appointments for the sharks yes. and the sharks would go and uh, yes. take care of the closers. And then, um, then I did Dish Network, and then I, a friend, a family had its company in South Florida, and they sold IT training classes. So I started putting on my big kid pants at this point and selling to government and also to these other organizations and entities and individuals. These larger package at the time was like fifty thousand dollars stuff, and I was like, oh, this is crazy. And um, that was a whole other story for another day. I had a hard time selling that because I couldn't fathom that somebody would pay $50,000 for something when my mom's annual income was like $25,000. It was just crazy. So I had a lot of hurdles overcome with that. Um, and anyways, after that, I, I did a server for, job for a little bit, which I think everyone should do Everybody a server should. job for a while. Yep. Um, and that was really great. And then I went, uh, started doing more in the, got into the healthcare side. So anyways, I graduated and then I got, went into uh, healthcare sales and then went into um, to doing manage IT services and around the electronic health record period, we sold that. Um, and then I went and landed in software and spent the rest of my time there before jumping for TSC. So the point there with it is that I, I got involved because a friend encouraged me, but it was, I knew I wanted to do business and it was multiple individuals that kind of said, based on your experience that you have with your church, like you should consider doing sales roles. Um, anyways, just kind of natural led to it. So, love it, love it, love it, yeah. love it. It has been so awesome having you on the show today. Thank you. Like we could talk to you forever. Oh, I, I, this is it's it's one of the shows that I am grateful and honored to be chosen to be a part of. I mean, a lot of people, you know, they'll have you a part of stuff and and you know want to invite you, but. I really, really was excited to be here and sorry for oh. listeners. I missed Is it my because first we're so stunningly Aww, beautiful or part. hilarious or smart? <laughs> it's because it covers Good. all of that. <laughs> and, you know, the thing there's, there's some shows you go on and it's just like it's just it, it does it's not 
this is a conversation yeah. and it's enjoyable. It just so happened that we're focusing on sales or yeah. some of those areas. Cause a lot of these topics we talked about was it was sales, but it was, as it's individual. It's a real well-rounded discussion. I think that makes something like this. very Sadly, exciting I don't think anybody really dropped long. an F-bomb. Like I think we kept it. I think we were on the straight and narrow here. Jeb, Jeb would be proud. Yeah, and we didn't we didn't even yeah. know about the Jesus Good Christ know. thing. I mean, Thanks. we um, for I, li- I like to, yeah. Our, one of our coworkers at Sales Gravy, uh, Miss Trisha, prays for us and our foul mouse. And I say to her, as a born again Christian that I am, who goes to church every sure. week and prays and does all the things, I said, Trisha, Jesus Christ still loves me. Sure does. Even though I'm foul mouth, I'm like I am a foul mouth Christian. He still love. I am. He we're hung not out supposed with to the be lepers perfect. and the prostitutes. I mean, no. it's cool. <laughs> All right. It's cool. He did. He, 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 he knows how to do it. In case you, in case you needed some knowledge, you like the Bible has some. Um, but let's shift gears to <laughs> our our fabulous final questions, oh, yeah. if you don't mind, Don. <laughs> Yeah, our signature First question. question is, how would you define the word sexy? I think the word sexy, and I think I may have shared it before, I think it's it's in the eye of the beholder, oh, right? Yes, it's did. it's it, it gives us the opportunity of um I think the world has its way of making us to to you know think like linear, put us in boxes at times. And I I think when you think about sexy, it is something that is is confident and there's two sides the individual that feels sexy <laughs> or the product that is sexy is something that it's great no matter what like you it's my phone is sexy to me it's a beautiful nice wonderful phone and some people might look at it and say i hate, I hate apple and it's not sexy well what is it that's sexy about it it's something that's appealing towards yeah. me great. and if it's an individual it's the same idea like it doesn't have to be like in the sense of sexy like uh like what people might think like it's you know physical beauty sexy could be am i an attractive well-rounded individual mm-hmm. to to and, and 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 do i feel that and that allows to bring that sex appeal, so to speak. It. That because if I if I feel confident in who I am, then it doesn't matter. And I've had uh, I I wouldn't say that I'm the was no Brad Pitt, but in college and in my days when I was a single guy, I was well confident in you my capabilities. You are very attractive. <laughs> and of that, just I felt that leave it I was at that, so- ladies and gentlemen, a very attractive man. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You are you are definitely easy on the eyes. Well, and, and well, you're so right, Don, because like I think the sexiest thing I think yeah. I just find it super duper sexy when my husband is like on a business call. <laughs> and I remember when Gina and I were at Outbound and that we were in with like Victor and Mark and um, Anthony, and they were doing this mastermind thing, and I was just like, God, this is so sexy. Just like. Being, being in your element, right? Like, <laughs> confidently in your element. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I find my boyfriend so sexy well, in his cop uniform. I, oh, Jesus. I mean, it's just like, like that. It's that, but I don't think everybody would feel that yeah. way. And I'm like, I'm not, I'm dialing through, like, I'm oh, dialing through, yeah. like, why? And like, every day when, <laughs> like, he gets ready for work, I'm like, oh, it's that time of the day you're getting your, yeah. putting your Some uniform on. Some people would run from right? I think it's just be. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's because, you know, at um just the the level of confidence he exudes when he puts it on. And I'm like, that's sexy. All right. We've got yeah. to move away from sexy because obviously we it. can go I deep. Um <laughs> what is the best go. advice you've ever been given, Don? Uh the best advice that I've ever, ever, ever been given. There's a couple. Um There's one that I, when I first started the business, it was, um, I attribute it back to to Norma. Norma is my mom. Um, And on my business card on the very back, I put the quote, because everybody put like a quote from like Henry Ford or, you know, these big tycoons of industry or, you know, Maya Angelou or whatever. I just, I put a quote, you can do whatever you want, Junior. Um, And that's how I refer to. And that advice, I mean, it sounds like it sounds something simple, but it's, if you think about that, you can do anything that you want, Junior. Like you can anything you want. And if somebody that gave me birth had that much confidence in me and my capabilities, it then showed me that I can do I can do anything that I would desire to do. And um, you know, 
it anyways, it, it just it inspires me. It's probably the best advice that I've had. Um, because you can you can apply it in so many different ways in our lives. So I, yeah. I think till I think it's definitely Go helped Norma. me a lot. We like it. Norma. Norma. Um and Norma. any advice you wish that you had been given? Mm. One of the advice that I wish I had been given is that you're not, and I'm trying to go back to what my, my, some of the stuff that I've learned over the years that kind of goes back to my early, early life, um, growing up in Jamaica. And I think it comes back down to, I'll tell you this. I live in in West Palm beach and West Palm beach is like, you know, we got some, some buku money down in, in Palm beach Island and, you know, near us and, and so forth. And I always just kind of put people into certain categories, like these people are super wealthy, so they're in that area. One advice I wish I would have known early on, that Oz isn't as big and mighty as we think Oz is. Mm. And the reason why I'm saying that is because the, a lot of the, I went, I had a, my high school was in a very, um, it was a very uh, was a prestigious magnet school here in South Florida and West Palm Beach. And it's a lot of the wealthy kids and the family went there, but you saw the kids and they were just like same people got a chance to interact with some of the families and they had the same kind of their problems. And, you know, they had more money, but money didn't solve their problems. And, um, but I always put people in with more money or more wealth in the higher echelon mm-hmm. and, or people who are, you know, perceived as popular in a different category. And it was, even though I got this advice from my mom, you can do anything you want. I didn't think that I was in, I can do anything I want within my own geographical, yeah. my, my own box, so to speak. Yeah. And once I saw that um, the mighty Oz wasn't as who Oz was, it helped me to realize, well, if they can do that, I could do that too. And once you start looking at the stories of people who are successful, you realize they weren't always successful. It was just a human being that was in a similar situation that really pushed and tried and got opportunities and worked hard and got lucky that led them to where they are. And they still brought all their same human problems with family depression or difficulties or, you know, whatever issues, no matter what. So I started to realize that I don't have to put put myself below anyone and that mighty Oz isn't as big and bad as Oz as who, you know, who it is. It's just a person back there um, behind the curtains and I'm a person and I have opportunities. I can make things happen as well. And as far as the concept that I learned, probably really, I I framed it into a term, the why not me principle, somebody's going to do something. Someone's going to be the first to land on Mars, look like Elon is working towards that. Somebody's going to be the first to cure cancer. Somebody's going to be the first to do something. Somebody's going to be the first to create something, a, a female podcast around sales. Why not me? Somebody's going to do it. Why that person can't be me? And taking advantage of why not me principle and realizing that Oz is as big as bad as Oz is perceived as. It's another person back there. There you go. I love so, it. Wish I had it earlier. I love it. That is awesome. So you have an amazing podcast. You do amazing things as a sales evangelist. Where can our listeners, the Warners, where can they hear you, reach out to you, find you? What are all the things? The best place to go to camp out where, uh, well, let's talk. Well, my home is the sales evangelist. So go to the sales and you'll get a chance to hear about my story. You can check out our podcast. You can also check out some of our offerings and just who I am as an individual. And if you want to just where I camp out the most is on LinkedIn, Donald C. Kelly. And I'm also on Instagram, Donald C. Kelly. In fact, any platform, Donald C. Kelly. But <laughs> if you want to connect with me, LinkedIn, here's a secret. If you really, really, really want to connect with me, don't go to LinkedIn and uh, try to go against everybody else. Go to Instagram and, ask him and about Donald C. Kelly promote and there'll be sell, less traffic. Sell it like a mango. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Tell me, I want to promote selling like a mango. Road, and I'll be like, yeah, yeah my yeah. rude boy. Wagwan. 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 Awesome. Donald Kelly, it was so Thank awesome you. having you here today on The Women Your Mother Warned You About. Thank you. We can't wait to have you back. And I just want to tell you, I appreciate it. And I just want to tell something to your listeners real quick. I know many of you listening to the podcast and you haven't done this yet, but please go ahead and leave a review for this show. It is so, 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 so critical because people are going to come and listen to the show afterwards and they're going to need that, that validation that they should subscribe because other people are subscribing to it and leaving reviews. And if there's, you're, they're not charging for you to listen to your podcast or to take advantage of all the education you're receiving. So if you don't mind, just do one thing, just leave that review and also just share that one of their podcast episodes 
on social media. I know it would go a long way for them. It goes a long way for me. And from a podcaster to another, I'm pleading to you as their listener to help them out with that. Aw, thanks. We didn't have to do that plug for once, Rachel. (laughs) That's awesome. Thank you, Donald. And thank you, Warners, for listening to this episode of The Women Your Mother Warned You About, sponsored and powered by Sales Gravy. For more information about Rachel or me or or that guy, Keith Walters, or anything Sales Gravy related, you can find everything at womenyourmotherwarnsyouabout.com or salesgravy.com or salesgravy.university. And Rachel and I are all over all the social things. So any final words from you, Rachel? Nope. I think Dawn said it best. Thanks for the review. Thanks for listening. And thanks for sharing. Bye, Warners. This really will get serious soon. Yeah. Don't. It doesn't have to. I don't think anybody wants it to be serious.